Learn to <laughs> and read, idiot. Read. <laughs> what are you guys Actually, doing listening to this? We're listening to us, so we have to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jacob Kenny. And I'm Liam McPherson. It's the newest edition of your barista's favorite podcast. It's, it's Speech, Speech from, from the throne. throne. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the halls of power. But not with another Pierre Polyev fluff piece. We're just here to argue. Hey, Liam, who are we talking to today? Well, Jacob, we've got a real treat for the listeners today. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the province of Quebec, specifically we're trying to figure out what is going on there. What is happening in Quebec? We've seen a lot in the news over the past four years since Francois Legault took the reins of power in the province. Uh, he has overridden the Charter of Rights and Freedoms multiple times for various causes. Um, now, he's, used, he's done that using a clause in the Charter called the Notwithstanding Clause, uh, which allows, it's called Section 33, and it allows um, a government to override the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in, uh, for legislation if they decide. Uh, now, he has done that for Bills 96 and 21, Bill 96 being uh, a, a law that aims to expand protection for the French language, and Bill 21, which is essentially... Uh, a, a ban on any sort of face covering uh, in public facing jobs. So not, not, not all public facing jobs. Oh, uh, so which, so which out of curiosity, which public facing jobs are exempt from that? Cause that's something we should probably touch on as well. Yeah. So it's, it's what they would call people in positions of authority. Oh. So a prison guard couldn't wear a face covering or, uh, or they couldn't wear a, a hijab, a cop, a judge, a crown attorney, a crown prosecutor, I should say. Um, and I, and, and, uh, and of course teachers, and that's, that's probably the most contentious element of it because I mean, whoever thought their teacher was a position of authority now, but, but I mean, no, t teachers is, is where probably the, the, this argument lies, yeah. like, like who, who can, you know, so sorry, no, please go back. No, no, no. The... I appreciate the interjection folks. This is, uh, Christopher Curtis from the Rover speaking. He's joining us today. Uh, it's actually a perfect segue into, in, into introducing you, Chris, uh, so Chris worked for the Montreal Gazette starting in 2011, but left his job in 2020 to found the Rover, uh, over at the Rover, Chris tells rich long form stories about underrecognized issues, indigenous communities in Quebec's North and the struggles of visible minorities and immigrant communities affected by the laws we're going to discuss today in part. Uh, he was recognized by the Canadian association of journalists for his reporting on an illegal dump on Mohawk territory. And last month, he even spent some time in Lviv, Ukraine, covering the effects of Russia's war on a populace that has accepted violence as part of its daily reality. It is our pleasure to have Chris on speech from the throne to help us dig into everything going on in his home province. So formally, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. Thank you very much, Liam. Uh, and appreciate, feel free to jump in because I, you know, we're, the reason we're having you guys on is we're, we're not, we're murky. You know, we're not uh, 100 percent clear on everything that's that's going on in Quebec. And as non-Quebecers, we want your guys opinion and your guys take on on all of these issues. And so feel free to jump in in any time if we're getting something wrong, because we definitely want to uh, to commit to the truth and being accurate. Well, you've seen my Twitter feed, so, you know, yeah, I have. Kind of a I, that's <laughs> kind of that's that's fair. So don't worry. I'll say I'll say shit. All right. Perfect. OK, that's what I want to hear. Uh, okay, so our, our second guest is Anaïs El Boujnaini. She is a reporter from French language network Nouveau. Uh, in 2016, Anaïs began her journalism career with a leap from her home province of Quebec to Radio Canada's Vancouver Bureau. While there, Anaïs won an award from the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Canada and the Canadian Foundation for Women's Health for her reporting on demystifying and destigmatizing menstruation. In 2021, she returned to La Belle Province, working with Nouveau's Trois-Rivières Bureau, before recently moving to their Montreal team. During her time at Nouveau, Anaïs has covered hot-button issues such as the coroner's report into the death of Joyce Echequan and Pope Francis's recent meetings with an Indigenous delegation from Canada. It is our pleasure to have Anaïs with us on the program to take a deeper look at what exactly is going on in the province. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So we're going to do a little bit of a, a roundtable format here. Um, I'm going to start with you, Anais, and I'm going to ask you about Bill 32, 
That is the recent bill that, and feel free to jump in if I'm getting any details wrong here, but to my understanding, it essentially allows educators to use any sort of word they want in an educational setting. Um, some people have named it the N-word bill. Um, is this, does this kind of law have legitimacy, Anais? Is this sort of a, a Lego sort of making a ploy to people who are claiming censorship in academic settings? What do you think about that? Oh my God, what do I think about that? Uh, <laughs> well, we need to mention that it, the, the law has not been, it's it's only a bill It's only right been now, tabled. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Bill, yeah. Um, and it stems from this infamous event that happened in the University of Ottawa, which- <laughs> In I Ontario. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. like the neighboring <laughs> province. Um, but I guess it was, so shocking to Quebec that they needed to, to spearhead their own or our own um, investigation into it. So th there is like a, a group of people that recently said, yes, we should um, do something about having complete academic freedom, including the right to say whatever word. And the, the Minister for Higher Ed Education, uh, McCann, uh, said that uh, a classroom is not a safe space. It's a space for debate, um, which I, I, I'm kind of maybe more of a classic journalist where I don't really want to say what I think, but <laughs> I, I find it troubling uh, to say the least. And yeah. we've, um, you know, the uh, students, groups of students uh, came out and said that it's maybe more of a generational gap than something to do with freedom of expression. It's a, so it's a I, huge generational gap. You're absolutely right. That's a hundred percent what it is. But but it's it's really odd. And, and yeah, like it, maybe we can talk about how a, a debate that happened in another university, like a province that has nothing to do with Quebec, ha, uh, stemmed or provoked this. Uh, I don't know, um, Chris, do you have any thoughts? Well, it starts more or less with Isabelle Haché, who, who wrote a series of articles on um, woke culture, what she calls woke culture, uh, cancel culture on university campuses. Uh, it started at the University of Ottawa, and then it got such a reaction that she did a larger investigative piece um, that was really targeted, you know, it was really about um, white, mostly white professors feeling as though wow. they didn't know how to navigate um, sort of the modern pol identity politics of, you know, not saying the N word if you're a white person or just like not. Yeah. And, and, and I uh, look, and I also think there's a deeper background of like, there is a sort of France French um, view of, of freedom of speech, which is an art and which is absolute. And it's, you know, uh, it's you can separate the man from the art. I mean, Roman Polanski lives in France, so, uh, uh, you know, still worshipped over there. Um, and 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 yeah. there's and but because you're you're a slave above all else to the art, you know, to the to the to the beautiful thing itself, and not necessarily to the person who said it and the things they did to children. Um, it's no, it's it's endlessly frustrating that he he gets a pass. Um, anyhow. It, uh, it started really like it, it came into the public conversation that way. And it was a, yeah, it was a, so it's a University of Ottawa and it was a Francophone teacher. There is a really um, seminal piece of Quebec uh, academia or Quebec intellectualism, uh, a book called uh, White N Words of uh, North America. Mm -hmm. And there's another, but this was actually a, a, in, a, in a literature class and it was how to make love to and and anyways it's it's these are like one of these is written by a black author and and um and i think the teacher wanted to have a conversation about like well why can't we you know like can we, let's just reclaim the word and like i don't think her intentions were Ooh. bad but i think it was really tone deaf and like yeah. let's reclaim it i'll say it first like it it's a really i don't know like it's a violent word you know if you're if you're a person of color if you're a black person you know you 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 lived your whole life knowing that you know, if somebody was really, really mad at you or whatever, that they could pull that out like as a trump card just to hurt you, yeah. knowing it would destroy you. And, and you had to live your life knowing that that could happen or that, you know, you were much more likely to be stopped by a, po a cop. And like, there's a whole power dynamic that, that I think that 
this person, this teacher didn't really maybe take into account. And then the whole conversation became about how absurd, you know, like kids these days and, uh, and Ashi won an award for it. And I, I like as, as an aside, I've, I, I, I once helped, this is and like, this tells you, I think a lot more about Quebec identity or just identity politics, generational identity politics, whatever. As she's like in her mid forties or fifties. And, um, she was doing, she was covering the Mohawk blockade a few years ago where Mohawks, um, in Tyantanaga or like in, in Ontario and also in, in Quebec were blocking railroads. And, um, uh, there was a lot of really stupid coverage uh, that basically, and I'm sorry, this is such an aside, but I think it's an important piece of context. All of the coverage was focusing on, um, you know, the pri the premier said, oh, the Mohawks have AK-47, so we can't go in there. And anyone who visited the protest site or the blockade or whatever, it was kids, it was women, it was a fire, it was like super peaceful. And and so Isabel Haché wanted to write an article that was like more like that, you know, more like showing like, hey, look, these aren't AK-47 wielding maniacs. Like, let, let's right. not make this more dangerous. But she doesn't know any Mohawks. And she's never been to, to Ganawage. So she asked me if I could give her my contacts. I don't like doing that. Uh, so I was like, how about I, I'll drive you around town and I'll show you around town. And like, and I remember, um, I remember thinking like, I, I'm only doing this because... I think that if there isn't better reporting that gets out there, this situation could turn violent. Like, like someone could attack yeah. a Mohawk or like, so I, I'm doing this in the interest of peace. And she wrote a really nice article. It was a really good article, but I look back and I think like, it's kind of fucked up that she didn't know anyone in the community. You know, it's fucked up that she never had occasion to go there. It's fucked up that like, you know, you work for a newspaper that has probably in its editorials expressed its desire for reconciliation. You're one of their most, mm -hmm. you know, they're one of, one of their most famous journalists and you're, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you don't know anyone in, in the indigenous community next to where you live, whose land, by the way, like they would claim is theirs. So, I mean, there is a little bit of, so, so, so like, this is like, I don't, I think she's a really nice person and I think she's a really good journalist, but I think she has a huge blind spot when it comes to race. And, um, and, and a lot of people do. And, and the Quebec identity is, is hard because, you know, you are, are you, af you have to square this circle, which is like, I am at once, uh, was, I am, I was the victim of colonialism, but I was also a perpetuator of, of, of colonialism. And, and that's a really, that's hard because in Quebec, if you were a Francophone, like you were a second class citizen for, for until relatively recently, mm -hmm. you know, in the 1960s, uh, with the emergence of the Jean Lesage liberals, um, Quebecers kind of took back, uh, sort of their place in society gradually. And, and, and this, almost all of our identity politics stem from that, you know, that like, that struggle. Yeah. And, and so a lot of these Francophones, um, who, or a lot of Francophones, I shouldn't say these Francophones, it sounds like it's a pejorative or something. <laughs> I'm half, like my mother's Francophone. Anyways, a lot, a lot of the Francophones in Quebec, um, only really experienced some sort of self-determination, like in the, in the realist sense, you know, for, for the last, you know, since the 1970s, let's say. So, so it's weird for, you know, to only experience uh, self-determination for a percentage of your life and then to suddenly be told, hey, by the way, you're also an oppressor. So it kind of just like fucking destroys people's intellectual world. And I'm not saying they're right. Like you, you know, you, yeah, you, Quebecers, I'm, I'm a white Quebecer. Like my, most of my lineage is Francophone. Like I am 100% the beneficiary of colonialism. Like, I don't think I would have done this well had my ancestors stayed in France. So like, it is okay to recognize that it doesn't mean that, you know, my life, uh, wasn't, didn't have hard aspects to it and I don't deserve some rights and recognition, but it, it certainly does. It certainly does force you to consider that um, you know your privilege, and a lot of people are not comfortable with that. And I think that's what this whole N-word debate is about. It's about people being really uncomfortable having their privilege checked. Uh, the people yeah. making the loudest noise about this are overpaid columnists who live in a fucking tower in downtown Montreal and have a damn fortune, and they're complaining about this because they have nothing else to get mad about. And the final thing I'll say about this, because I think it's so fucking pointless, but I, I th it needs to be said. Um, this is a way for this government, or any government, really, to not run on their record, you know? 
you excite people with these useless identity issues to uh, to distract from the fact that you know in Quebec we have the uh, lowest high school graduation rate of any of the ten provinces. I believe we have the highest functional illiteracy rate. Um, you know our prisons have the most suicides. Uh, we have the most COVID deaths. There are aspects, you know, the, the corruption, if you think corruption is, is done in Quebec, like, I'm sorry, but there's a ton of bid rigging in construction still. So, like, we are a province that has many huge structural problems. And it's not because we're bad or corrupt or whatever, but, like, we're a society like any other, and, and ours happens to have mm -hmm. a few really big problems at the center of it. And you can't run on the record of fixing that because that's a really hard to do and that requires a lot of uh you know and this will bring us to our next question by the way is a lot of these same kind of issues but uh yeah yeah i, I believe that it 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 speaks to our inability to to win elections uh or to wage elections on on really important issues uh you know like like our infrastructure or like uh public transit or like um you know our fucking failure of an educational system our, how how badly we have failed our seniors time and time again you know our, our our elder care centers were like death traps during covid like we we so instead of focusing on that we focus on like who does this kid think they are telling me i can't say the yeah. n-word and then you'll turn on the radio and someone says it like 20 times like it's a broken toy oh yeah. gosh oh man i think chris you you hit the nail and it's a pretty simple one in a way it's i feel like a classic case of oppressed people thinking they cannot be oppressors and and that is one of the mm. biggest uh, construct in, in in the Quebecois identity I think and just to maybe uh, segue a little bit I my my dad is um, is an immigrant he's from Morocco and when he immigrated to Quebec, it's funny, he just visited me in Montreal and he said, you know, when, when I was here in the 80s, you could not get a decent coffee unless you took the bus to um, to the Italian uh, neighborhood, right? And I'm, I'm saying mm -hmm. this not as an anecdote, but m maybe more of as an exemplification of how closed off the, the province was. And I'm talking Montreal, I'm not talking about a little city um, deeper in, in Quebec. Um, so it's very recent that this province opened up to, to the world, if, if I may. So I think those issues are really easy to, to kind of toss like a stake to, to dogs if you, um, if you want to distract from, from bigger <laughs> That's a issues. great, that's I mean, a great anecdote. I really like that. Your dad's from Morocco. That's super cool. Yeah. And, and he remembers also in, uh, 1982, there was this big um, racist incident uh, with taxi drivers um, that basically um, pointed out the the uh, Asian uh, people from IT. Um, they were deemed to steal jobs. Uh, I, I don't want to get into like the, the entire yeah. history of, of that um, riot, but my dad like remembers being told you're here stealing our jobs um and and he's not the only person that has this memory we're talking 1980s uh and then you, you like compounded with what you you said chris about like how re like journalists today don't have access to indigenous pop people uh, as sources like how how is that okay you know um and and that probably extends to you know people talking uh, if you talk about immigration I'm, I'm sure i have a lot of colleagues that have n never met uh people of color you know outside of uh, the context of, of being reporters um so, so yeah I, I think that speaks a lot versus when i was in vancouver it was impossible like you could not be in vancouver or bc and not have met someone uh, outside of you know whiter whiter canada anyhow so that's those are great points, guys. I'm gonna pull in Jacob here real quick to to weigh in as well, and then we'll. There's a lot to chew on here, so I've got some follow ups. But Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I I'm interested in, in your guys's interpretation of of the directionality of this because we're we're talking about a generational gap, which sort of assumes that you know with time these racists are gonna die off, 
they're going to be replaced by a new generation that is thinking a little more openly, more accepting of the world. Is this the reality? Or, you know, at the same time, uh, Chris, you're talking about Jean Lesage, but um, uh, Legault, he's saying that his icon, the, the guy that he wants to emulate is, is Maurice de Plazy. The, the premier that came before. The one I don't know if he ever hot. said that, that he was trying to emulate him, but I think he defended him sort of indirectly. Oh, certainly. And, and it's sort of like, it like, feels to me like Legault is, is, is trying to pick up that legacy of pulling Quebec back. People, we, well, pe people are revisiting, like, like yeah. it just so happens that Maurice Duplessis is getting a makeover in, in yeah. the intellectual circles. Which is know, horrifying, think, yeah. horrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, so for those of you, if, if you're in the rest of Canada, if you don't know, Maurice Duplessis was uh, a union-busting, anti-intellectual, big conservative ally of the Catholic Church, um, really complicit in the exploitation of Quebec workers from American industrialists. He was a son of a bitch, but I mean, he hated the right people too. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. I think that turned people on to, to his brand of nationalism because yep. he did like defend Quebec in uh, interprovincial, uh, you know, rivalries or whatever. He did defend Quebec and, and, mm -hmm. and he, you know, there was a distinctness to, to like the, the, to us as, as, as a people. And, and, and there, there was a certain sort of like, I think people think like like now they look back and they see nostalgia, you know, they see yeah. like they see a simpler time. And when they say simpler, they mean like I mean, a simpler a time, time, a whiter time. Yeah. Um, but but they're like like you're forgetting that, you know, these were times where, you know, Quebecers lived um, were among the poorest people in North America. Like like mm -hmm. these were bad times uh, for Quebecers. And yet they look back and and I don't know, I think there is a sort of a longing for something that they can understand because you can understand that the new world is a little harder to understand because well it requires you to think in a context that you just you know that like totally outside of your own reality you know like who um all of a sudden having to you know to to, to confront the fact that uh you know a woman might choose to wear a headscarf like this it's not it wasn't forced upon you and it's it's actually an expression of your individuality and it's an expression of your your, your, like, it can even just be an expression of your, your feminism. Like, they can't to them. It's like, but that's different than our struggle. Our struggle was away from a religion. You know, why are you, why are you embracing your faith? And, and they don't realize that to so many people who come from overseas, like, faith was their only, like, faith was, faith was what kept yeah. them going in, in, under a tyranny. Or faith was what kept them, you know, sane. And, and, uh, and instead they see, all they see is their own oppression from the Catholic Church, and mm. and so it, uh, it it's weird. He is getting this historical makeover, and I don't. I mean, and he hasn't like he uh, Duplessis like sorry Legault hasn't. He said, well, you know, at least you know, Duplessis had his faults, but at least he defended Quebec, and I think that yeah. that is very much what I think François Legault would like to see written on his grave. <laughs> He had his flaws because he'll admit to his flaws and he'll admit like, like he does backtrack and he can be a thoughtful person. Like he's not this caricature. Like I think he's out of touch and I think there's a mean streak in him that I don't like, but he is a thoughtful person. Like he does, he is able to change his mind. Like he has, he's not as stubborn as people might think, mm -hmm. but so he, I think he would concede on his, on his tombstone. He would want, he would want for it to read. He had his flaws, but at least he defended Quebec. Well, and I'd like to definitely hear from, from Anais about this. Like, are we, if, if we take France sort of as a lodestone, like Quebec is racist now, but if they see over the seas, they could be much more racist. They have like far right well, candidates I, that I, are I would say that like, almost winning elections. You have I, I, on TV. Like, I, I don't think so Quebec is, there. I don't think Quebec is any more racist than anywhere else. I think mm -hmm. Quebecers are just more upfront about it. Yeah, like, yeah, I think that's true. When, when there was that the the hotline, the barbaric practices hotline from Stephen Harper, like that was popular across Canada at the same true. percentages. There's, I think, there is traditionally a different interpretation of religious uh, freedom for the for the French and for the English. Like we see it, mm -hmm. English people see it as an individual right, uh, whereas the French see it as like keep your religion out of my state. Like I get that. There's a, I don't agree with that view of it. Like, I think it's, or at least, like, I don't think the religion and state should mix, but I don't, I, I, I tend to kind of lean more towards individual religious liberties and not like, okay, we'll prevent the white majority from ever seeing something that displeases them. 
Um, but but uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So that's where I was kind of going. With yeah, that. I, I think it's a da- dangerous uh, pitfall to to just paint Quebec as a racist nation. I I think that never flies um, when you you try to put that that cloak on. And who's Quebec? What's Quebec? Like, who are the Quebecers? And I think, uh, Chris, you did a, a great job at, at reminding that, you know, with Maurice Duplessis, who I want to remember, like, remind people about this, like, really frightening thing. Um, they're called the orphans of Duplessis. And so oh, yeah. they they were like those people, uh, kids that were um, labeled uh, um, mentally ill without being so and they were treated in like uh, orphanages with very dubious practices uh with the corp cooperation of the the catholic uh church and so with the tranquil revolution and i know it's it's maybe like maybe common knowledge but i just want to remind people that this happened like this quebec of darkness and poverty that like suddenly became modern thanks to the the revolution tranquille and of course people will have this epidermic reaction to religion being mixed to uh, politics and i think that's what we're seeing yeah. as a as a reaction to this this law but i i, I would be careful at, at calling it racist and i think we don't see the same thing as uh, what we're seeing in France, like the, the okay. this this um, call to like an extreme right, I think we, there's a, a nuance to be um, yeah to be added. But because, I would keep I would it, keep an eye on France because the debates that we're having today they were having 15 years ago. You know, like that's exactly what like, I was trying to get. Yeah, I, I think that's question. what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the debates that we're having now they were having 15 years ago, and 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 again, like I just my fear is that. Whether the next government is a CAC or a liberal, or a, I think that they're going to struggle on the meat and potato stuff, and they're going to go to the identity stuff because it's easy. Mm-hmm. And 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 once the shock of Bill Twenty One wears off, once the shock of Bill Ninety Six wears off, or whatever, um, you need something else. And 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 I think that's kind of what happened in France. Is you just, I mean, of course, their context is way different. The 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 there's a million like they there's a many 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 different ways in which is it's different but i i i always like my my mind is trained to expect the worst and uh but i do believe that like you know fundamentally quebecers are some of the most decent and and wonderful and loving people you'll ever come across i think it's just it's a society in the middle of an identity crisis and a lot of what you're seeing isn't necessarily very pretty but I, I i certainly don't think it represents the majority opinions here and i certainly think there's a lot of ignorance that isn't necessarily meant to to harm but it does harm 15 years ago in france is so different and i'm also expecting the worst um maybe in 15 years we'll just talk about climate change because that's going to be the only <laughs> thing that will matter and hopefully in, in my whole condemnation of the government, I didn't want me, once mention its record on climate change, yeah. which is awful, but I'm sorry. That's an excellent reminder, Anais. But yeah, I just, I think Quebec in, in this crisis, hopefully, and that's maybe um, what I hope for Quebec is to accept that we are deeply American. We're not French. And I think... This reckoning is, is starting to happen when we see the reaction of uh, maybe a younger generation of, of Quebecois who are okay to, they know they have to speak English and and they, they know it's okay. And more and more, uh, you know, m- mixed uh, people like, like me from different backgrounds, like people from, you know, uh, coming from immigration. I think the, the context is very different from France where you have like this deep seated racism um that that's uh, like against um especially like north africans and especially muslims i i think we we kind of have that a little bit here but it's it's so different so i, I don't know if it's like informative to to look at what kind of debates they were having 15 years ago but that's my own opinion it's tempting now it, it is yeah of course and and you look you look at the popular like like i think the ultimate sign of like or like the Okay, have you ever, I, this happened to me when I was going to Ukraine, I was on a, a, a flight to France first, 
and I see the um, the flight attendant. He's talking to this French couple. He's a Quebecer. They're French. Doing the most theatrically French accent, and he's like clumsily using their expressions. Uh, and I'm just like, I'm embarrassed for him at like this act of supplication before the Mère Patrie. Like, I know that we came from there a long time ago, but so many people in intellectual circles in, in Quebec need the validation of, of the French. And so like Mathieu Bacote, oh God, him. um, was popular. No, he was popular here, but, um, the minute he was accepted in France, the way he's been embraced, he was La Presse was calling him, or someone who worked for La Presse, one of the like not crazy newspapers. Like, and I shouldn't, La Presse is an amazing newspaper. Like, I, I, I should, I, but, um, but one of the newspapers and like a serious non Quebecor newspaper referred to him as like a significant or the most significant intellectual in modern oh, Quebec. Boy. And, and the, the leader of the Parti Conservateur de Quebec, like, like, I don't know, there's like, I see a kind of, I see a reverence in on the right for the intellectuals of France and for the the uh, not necessarily like Eric Zemmour, but like they love they love uh, Macron and, and there are things to like about Macron, but Macron's policies like have further criminalized the existence of Muslims. Like yeah. being Muslim is is increasingly difficult in France, and he only accelerated that trend with the the, the ban on uh, the ban on hijabs, hijabs for anyone who's yeah, yeah under, under eighteen anywhere in public like. Um, so, so I, I, I do see some admiration, but I, I also think Anais is pointing out to a really, like, it's the first time I ever thought of it this way. Thank you. And I, and Anais, like what a warrior working in Frig Trois Rivières in Vancouver, like going all over the place. Like that, that takes, uh, and Nouveau, man. Anyways, you work with a great team. You guys are awesome. Oh, um, likewise, I admire your, <laughs> All right, no, you don't Everything have to do anything. With the you don't no, seriously. Anything. No, Chris, she's not <laughs> kidding. But, uh, I had a phone but, call, but, and I, I said, I got, I got Chris Curtis. Oh, my gosh, I love Chris. Like, trust me, it's genuine. <laughs> all right, well, all right, get the check here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> um, no, no, so so I, I think there's, a, there, like, what Anais said was, was great, that, like, we are American, and it doesn't mean that we're, like, our neighbors to the south, but there is a set, there is a way that things are done on this continent mm -hmm. that they're not done over there. And I, and, and you can look at our closest relatives over there and we just do things here in a much different way. And Quebec, not only has Quebec been influenced by that, but like Quebec has influenced that as well. Quebec drives, cult people forget, like Quebec drives culture in North America and Quebec does like, there are Quebecers out there doing, you know, I mean, Dune, you know, is, is right. an example of success in America, but there's Quebec music, there's Quebec culture, there are like Jack Kerouac's people come from Quebec. Like Quebec has, has made a, a, a huge contribution to North America. And like, and sometimes we look to the outside as a threat when really we should see it as this thing that we interact with and, and whose imagination we exist in, in this kind of romantic place. But, but it's, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think what Anais said was like, I don't know, it's fucking profound. So there's a lot to chew on here. And basically, I mean, what you guys have been saying, particularly about like the identity crisis thing, I think that's a very, very accurate thing to say that the, that the province is having something of an identity crisis. And I, so I've lived most of my life outside of Quebec. When I was living in the Ottawa uh, area, I did live on the Gatineau side for two years. Uh, and one, I remember I was sitting out back once, um, I think with Jacob, actually, I think you were there, Jacob, but tell me if I'm misremembering this, uh, Jacob and I were sitting out back and my neighbor comes out. And he's a, a francophone, very nice guy. But he, I remember it was during the 2021 election and the uh, debate uh, in which uh, Shachi Curl uh, asked that question about Bill 21. And he was incensed. He was incensed that you would even ask that. Uh, and he, uh, I mean, a lot of the columnists of the day, I remember in the French media, were framing it as Quebec bashing. Uh, there were polite suggestions from people like uh, Emily Nicolas on maybe a better way that that Shachi could have phrased the question. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's I think ninety six. I think it lumping ninety six in was was a uh, was a bit clumsy. A little clumsy. Because it, it, it was yeah yeah. But I but I mean it's hard. <laughs> it, it's not easy. It's not easy yeah, to moderate. Yeah. But this so this guy was upset. And, and at the same time, like twenty one is like if you know if you use the notwithstanding clause to get around people's human rights, you know there's something wrong. With well, the law. well, exactly. Like, you know that like 
you're going to open yourself mm -hmm. up to some criticism. I think where the debate would be is they'll say, oh, well, you know, maybe some, maybe like you can, we can have a conversation about does it target Islam or is it anti-religious? Yeah. But like, but, but the thing is a lot of these people don't consider this in their argument is that like it affects bill 21 almost exclusively affects women of color. Like, I was sitting down with this guy and, and I said, so, cause I wanted to hear his perspective and like, there was no vitriol in my voice. I said, you know, like tell, I want you to tell me why you, you know, why, why did you feel it was Quebec bashing where, you know, where are we, where are we getting this wrong kind of in understanding your point of view? And he said, well, and actually one of the first things he cited was the quiet revolution. Uh, and he's, and he explained that there's certain, a certain amount of religious trauma, which you guys touched on very beautifully. Um, and it, it still affects, like Chris was saying, it still affects people to this day when they see new immigrants come over who are particularly more pious new immigrants. They think, you know, how come you're not like us? And they shouldn't think that, but that's what they think because they're so deeply traumatized by an institution that had such deep roots in the province still does, but really did until the sixties. And that's what he was saying. He said, it's almost like we're, it's like this trauma we're getting over. And I said, okay, but I said, I, and that's completely valid. But I kind of then I asked him, I said, so you're traumatized and I understand that. But how is re traumatizing or sorry, how is traumatizing other people a way to move on from your trauma? You know what I mean? By passing, by putting into into power laws like Bill 21, putting into effect laws like Bill 21, you're traumatizing another religious group, thereby putting them through a similar trauma that you already went through, went through. What you should be doing is try to see it from their perspective. Like Chris was saying, see it as a symbol of his individuality, see the person, you know, through the face covering or whatever. Like it's, it, there are people there that are, their, their whole personality isn't that face covering, but there, there seems to be this, because of this identity crisis, it, it's, it's almost like some of the population has the blinders on. And I think that you're absolutely right. It's stoked by people like Francois Legault, who when, when they're not maybe doing so well with the deaths in long-term care homes, or they're not doing so well with other things or, or, you know, just governing in general, they toss red meat and then everybody chews on the red meat. And the whole Journal de Montréal is full of, full of people going on about it. And it's just, it's, it's just this regular occurrence that we see. And I hate to say it, Chris, like, because I'm an avid follower of yours, I do see a lot of Journal de Montréal uh, more than I probably want to see. Um, but that's okay, because like, it, it's, it's just demonstrating how endemic I think it is in, in part of the media culture, this view of, you know, it's absolute freedom of speech at all costs, no matter who we're traumatizing or who we're hurting. But it's not, it's not, because the second I say something they don't like, you know, they're going to fucking swarm me and like, I get death threats and I'm really? like, like, oh, I mean, I'm being not an Anglo or no, no, just for being an asshole. Like that's <laughs> oh. <laughs> not <laughs> an Anglo. No, like, cause I'm a fucking like, cause I don't shut my mouth and like, it's not, it's not because I'm no, it's not, it's because of my, so behavior. what you're saying is it's absolute um, freedom of speech for Francophones only. Uh, no, 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 no. Or I think, what do you, I think what are you saying I think here? That, but what I like, it's, it's the classic, this is a, and this is, I think where it becomes more of a generational thing because they're complaining about woke culture in the United States. And it's always the same old people. And like they find one person, uh, who is young, who can like, okay, well this person, who's the New York times columnist oh, who started a, a sub stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gab, yeah. I've, I've heard a yeah, kind of wow. thing about her. Gabby. Oh my God. Anyways, that the, like they, they find someone young. And kind of hip, and they'll be like, well, that person, you know, that person's anti-woke, therefore. Oh, and so, so anyways, like, this anti-woke thing is, is like, goes beyond Quebec. Like, it's everyone, you know, everyone's Ooh. kind of... Wokeism, yeah. But, like, I think people had maybe more time to deal with it elsewhere, and, like, it kind of hit us all at once, and people are just fucking really mad about it. And it it becomes a sort of, like, a slur that you can you can throw at someone to discredit what they're saying. Well, he's a wokeist. Like, you care about other people. <laughs> Fuck you. But that's what's so frustrating, <laughs> Chris, amazing. is uh, particularly during my time in the province, I, I tried to, in Quebec, I tried to read more French media, and I still do try. Uh, you know, it's my second language, working on it. Um, but, you know, like, when I'm doing my reading in the French media that, uh, in Quebec, that's all I see is wokeisme, wokeisme, wokeisme. And it's like the new, it's the new thing that's sort of just used to discredit people who are trying to stick up for minority rights or trying to stick up for yeah. language rights. Yeah. And it's, it's a shame it pollutes the conversation because like you said, 
Quebecers can be some of the warmest people that you've ever met in your life. Just, you know, they're, they're no, it's not that they're more racist than anywhere else. It's that the, the, the racism is more upfront from, you know, f- f- possibly for cultural reasons. Uh, it certainly exists in English Canada. I can tell you that as a, as a mixed <laughs> guy, it exists. Yeah. And it, it's just kind of, it, it, in English Canada, it's almost like simmering beneath the surface kind of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Whereas in, in Quebec, maybe, and I don't know, I, I don't know why, uh, Particularly, it just seems to be a little bit more upfront or on the nose, maybe, uh, and and so that brings me to Bill ninety six then and and language rights. So obviously, Quebec is, is it's a francophone majority in a in a big Anglophone continent, uh, uh, with the exception of Mexico, um, but it's sandwiched there in between. You know, Canada and the U.S. very very English. Quebec is there as part of Canada, but it's the francophone sort of slice of Canada, and. It can feel very isolating, I think. So you want to do everything you can do to protect that language. It's sort of because it's sort of a minority section, you have to protect that language. But does this bill go too far? Does it strike a good balance? Is he justified, Francois Legault, in using the notwithstanding clause? What do uh, you guys think, Chris and Anais? And then Jacob can jump in. I feel like I was just talking a lot, so I think Anais should say something if she wants it. Maybe why don't we why don't we start with Anais and then we'll go to Jacob and then we'll do to, we'll do yeah. Chris. We'll flip it. Um, I feel bad because that's kind of the the, the bill that I've been following the least. Um, I don't know. This year is going to be the hundredth year of the Loi Cent Un, or the the like fortieth year or the the. The 101 was in the 80s. Yeah, exactly. The, oh, sorry, yeah. what, what am I saying? It's the you said 100th. 100th. I was like, oh, yeah. shit. How old am I? <laughs> How much time has passed? I'm so it's, fucking old, man. Uh, it's the, the the creator of this law uh, was born 100 years ago. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm okay, getting okay. my thing. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Then 100th birthday, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, Camille Lorrain, the, the guy b- behind it, that's who I'm referring oh, to. Oh, sorry. But Chris, p- please... Um, Please go with like Bill ninety six. I'll um, ninety six. Oh well, yeah, and and it, but it's touchier too because you're you're covering it and you want to like say it's it's right or wrong. And I I I understand. Uh, that. I can because fucking who's gonna hire me? I'm my own boss. Um, <laughs> I I can say what I want. The 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 thing is that I is that it doesn't really address the problem. Like you're you're losing French as in North America, French is, is like losing ground, but in Quebec, the only place where French is losing significant ground is in the language spoken at home. Uh, so you'll have immigrant families where like they speak perfect French or they speak perfectly adequate French, but at home they, you know, they speak whatever language is their mother tongue. And, and, and that's just how families are. And so, that habit gets passed down the generations and people all speak French. They just don't maybe identify as Francophone. And, and, and then therefore in public, they might speak English or they might speak. So like, this is annoying to some people, but I don't think that, um, so 96 basically gives, um, it, it, uh, it beefs up the office de la langue française. Like it beefs up their powers of inspection Um, I think, you know, it gives them the power to like do warrantless searches of businesses, um, which of course would never stand up in court and like it, it, so they won't happen, but it, it, and, uh, most significantly it, it, an amendment to 96 would make it, uh, so that Anglophones, um, Anglophones going to CGEP, uh, or which is our like junior college have to complete three non-French courses in the French language. So like a biology class or a math class or whatever, you have to complete this in French. And that's kind of like, that's just red meat. Like it's not, wasn't that a liberal amendment? It was a liberal amendment. Yeah. Let's not talk about it. And they regretted it immediately. Like it was so really stupid. Um, But, but again, like the, the problem is that we have a terrible educational system and um, we, you know, not enough of us speak or write the language well. And I include myself in this. Like, I think I've spoken French my whole life, more or less. And I've written for, I learned French in primary and, and er, the first two years of high school. But um, our high school starts earlier. So anyways, so I, I, I can, like, I've been educated in French and I can barely write it. And it's, and it's a very, and I, you know, of course I'm lazy and stupid, but. Also, 
like I no no but I think I think my <laughs> yeah yeah I think it's um sorry my cat um my cat just uh kicked me um Oh, yeah, I yeah. We have the no. feed for that. We need to get the videos on this, Liam. <laughs> but uh, we all but have cats. I, I no, I, I all of which is to say, like the 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 real problem is we, you know, like our education system, but also like people who come here, they don't have access to good quality French education. Uh, it's expensive. It's hard. You have to work. Um, so if you really want to address the problem, it's fucking expensive and i think it's it's the way you should approach it you know you should pay people to more to take french classes you should subsidize this kind of shit so like it's expensive and reforming the education system is expensive but those would work of course you know you can't win an election on reforming the education system it's been done dozens of times and each time we get the same result which is just bullshit uh, I mean, again, we're like, we're at the bottom of the barrel in, in Canadian, I'm not saying Quebecers are dumb, no, by no means, but like our, our graduation rates just aren't good enough. And, and our, our, the fact that we have such a high functional illiteracy rate is, is not good enough, like we need to do better. But you can't, again, you can't do that overnight, that takes time, that takes uh, bipartisan effort, you know, you can't win on a bipartisan effort, and or tripartisan, or however many parties have to be involved. So, I mean, we know how to fix the problem, or at least we have a very good idea of how to fix the problem. But it's easier to, like, stoke people's anger over the fact that, you know what, some fucking kid said bonjour hi to me at the store, and I only want to be spoken to in French. And, like, I get it, but at the same time, like, you live in a, a world of globalization. It's in, unavoidable that people are going to be, you know, that you're going to start hearing the languages mix. But I love French. It needs to, you know, it needs to survive. We need to do what we can. But I just don't see it on Bill 96. I think Bill 96 is, you know, it's just, it's, it's just more red meat. And, and, you know, what I'm doing right now is I'm falling into the trap. I'm talking negatively about it. And someone's going to say, well, of course the Anglos hate it. Like, look, look at this fucking asshole talking shit about Bill 96. They hate us. And so it, it sets up the next piece of red meat, which is like, whatever that is. Another Journal de Montréal column is probably the next piece of red meat. But I think you've, you've got it all right. And, and that's how I think media should shift the narrative and start talking about how our teachers are paid like a very indecent wage and I'm, I'm going to be polite here they're paid indecently low um they're working in conditions that are fucked up like they're they're working with <laughs> like like in in classrooms where the the, the co2 level is yeah. is that bad yeah. that they have to they they're told um open the window um in, <laughs> even if it's winter to kind of make sure the co2 is is, is okay like schools yeah. are, 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 are they're wow. telling they're telling the parents. teachers to like fuck with the tests like like lie on the test lie on the test because we can't afford to to show them the wrong results it's like soviet union shit with air and, quality and then, oh my god like if you if you like want to be broader and, and just start talking about poverty and how people show like kids show up to school hungry and that's probably not super good for learning it's I mean, it's not me saying that. Research uh, shows yeah, it no, time it's, and it's, time yeah. again. And you have, as you said, like uh, illiterate rates that are uh, like off the roof, which means that people cannot read for themselves, which means they listen to radio. And that's their only means of maybe being, and I'm talking about that on a podcast, maybe I, I shouldn't. But, you know, if you like only <laughs> hear what we listeners. say. Yeah. Learn to <laughs> and, read, idiot. <laughs> What are you guys doing listening, listening to this? Listening to us, so we have to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's and 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 then we're we're gonna talk about like how some English people need to 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 take three classes. You know, like it's it's, it's a band aid solution, and it's not even a band aid solution, honestly. It, it's not the problem for the the lack of or the, the if you feel that French is not strong enough, this is not where we should be looking at. I'm sorry, but I speak right. four languages and French is my first language. And I, th I think I do a pretty decent job of speaking it and writing it. Um, so I, I yeah, I, it, it, <laughs> it frustrates me so much that this, uh, this wins, this wins in the public, uh, opinion. This, this is winning in like, uh, public spheres. And, and then again, like the worst thing we can do right now is pit, the English Quebecois and the French Quebecois. Like we need to talk together and we need to start looking at 
again, climate change, about how it, we can do reconciliation with uh, First Nations, and how can we uh, make sure immigrants that come here have a, a decent, uh, France, like, uh, francisation class, I don't know how you say that, like a Yeah, Frank I mean, that's uh, learning French. I, mean, I call it francisation too, like, I don't know what else it's called. And, and how can... Francisation. And, <laughs> and how can we lead on making sure immigrants get their papers recognized because we decided as Quebecois to also uh, have power over immigration like can we start looking at okay you're a doctor maybe you should work as a doctor and yeah, not maybe you be... shouldn't be driving an uber like it, it's it's so degrading not that it's degrading it, to drive a, an uber but like the guy the guy was uh, you'll see like a surgeon or an engineer or a, and you're thinking like oh well you know and we've seen it during the pandemic in Ontario, where the the government's uh, the the government decided to say, "Hey, if you're in a field of um, you know health science, you can you, you know just to help us right now because we're in the middle of a crisis." I think they did, they're doing in. that with nurses here. I think they're doing that with nurses here. And yeah, and they started doing it, but I can. And, but initially, they weren't accepting Haitian nurses, which is like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it was. I well, they, they amended it, Yikes. so like, for, let, let's just say it was an honest mistake because I've said so many bad things about this government. I don't want to you know, just like, I'll leave this one alone and, they, and then I can say, okay, well, see, I defended you that one time. Please <laughs> let me interview Francois to go live. <laughs> but that, that's, that's my position on, on Bill 96 where we are detracted from the core problems. And as you said, Chris, it takes so much effort and time to repair a system that is not functional right now but also like the 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 one thing i'll say about these these laws or the one thing i said so many fucking things another thing i'll say about these laws is that it's it like quebec is a fun place and like what makes quebec different and unique and there is a sort of like there is a joie de vivre it is a real thing and um and that's attractive like i want to be a part of that i don't want to be a part of a system that's like uh, this letter's too big. Like, come on! Don't get me like, don't get me wrong. Signage stuff. I don't give a shit. Have the sign in French. I think it's 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 important. It's important that it be in French. And Bill One Hundred One is important. It is like it might not seem fair to outsiders, but I think it's super important. And and those are important things. But like, to constantly be like these petty little things, like oh the menu font or whatever, like. It makes us seem like such ball busters, and you know we aren't. Like, I hope. I, I want to give you guys some insight into kind of the rest of Canada, and I think I think you know where I grew up in Ontario, B Barry, Ontario. It was very English, very, very, very English. We're proud to be Canadian. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah and yeah. so I think Ontarians are, are some of the only people who like first identify as Canadian and then their region. Yeah. Like every, almost everywhere else in Canada, yeah. is like, I'm from the fucking prairies. I'm from the West Coast. Yeah. I'm from yeah. Atlantic Canada. In Ontario, it's like, I'm from Canada. I'm Canadian. <laughs> um, and you know what? And and so, uh, Anais and I were talking, and, and Jacob and I were talking before you got in there, Chris. <laughs> I was and, like, that's uh, true. <laughs> no, that will, but no, that's all right. But, but we were talking about um, good old Mike Harris, uh, who was Premier of Ontario in the 90s. And one of the things he did among many, he was very good at cutting and he basically just got in with his proverbial sitters and, uh, scissors and he sliced up Ontario's French program uh, into yeah. a core French program and an immersion program. And core French sounds good. You know, it's, it's great politi politispeak. Um, but core French is what I took. It's a complete joke. I took it every single grade from grade four to grade nine. So from the time I would have been about eight to the time I would have been about 14, 13, 14. And it was basically like, okay, let's learn avoir and let's learn être, and then let's not speak French the entire class or learn anything valuable. Um, I could not string a French sentence together, uh, and and I had an opportunity to move uh, to another school that had an extended French program, which is somewhere in between immersion and core. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say myself and a lot of the people I knew were our attitude wasn't like, oh, what a great opportunity. Yeah, it was, why do we need to kid. learn French? Yeah. Exactly. Kid, you don't Why do I need do to learn this language? Their, yeah, like uh, people only appreciate that shit later in life. It's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's just, that's just kids. Yeah, if and it's in but school, I mean, like, what can we do? It. What can we do to improve things in the rest of Canada? Like, it's, it's really quite 
sad because uh, when I started learning French, when I it was when I'd moved to Ottawa for the the journalism program at Carleton, uh, and I went away in at the end of the second year. I went away actually to Trois Rivières. It sits near and dear to my heart, always beautiful place. Uh, went away there for just six weeks, and the amount that my French improved. It was full immersion. If we catch you speaking English. Uh, we're going to give you a red card. If you get three red cards, you get kicked out of the program. Like it was some serious shit. Uh, and it was one of the best things I ever did. And what an appreciation that I, I garnered uh, for the French language. And uh, you know, what a beautiful language it is, what a beautiful uh, culture it is. And Jacob did the same yeah, program we as well. Explored. And I think he has yeah. positive, you have positive things to say about it as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, and we need more of that because it, it, yeah. a lot it's of also this, a bit of a self-selecting group though. Like you, you, um, you, you went and you took that leap and I think that says a lot about you and I think, but more people should. Know, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think it's the fear of embarrassing yourself, you know, the fear of, of not being heard and not being understood and, and, and self-doubt and, and I, I think that's why such a, it's one of the reasons it's such a sensitive issue is that like. It's, it's when you, when you, you know, you, when you don't feel hurt, when you don't, you feel stupid and you feel, and it's, a, it's aggravating. Sure. It's, it hurts. And, and that's, you know, and like a lot of Frank of all were told they were stupid and, 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 but then like, you know, I, I get that resentment and I, I, you know, and, 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 and so it's, 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 I think it's, it's, it's hard to overcome that, but like, yeah, I think, I think probably Frank, you know, not only like, like, French education, like Franco Ontarians, we need to support the shit out of them. Thing in in New Brunswick, like Absolutely. those are you know the 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 premier doesn't speak, and and it's kind of it used to be a requirement to at least pretend to try, and this guy doesn't even try, and um and there's and so like where French is struggling and Manitoba as well, you know where French is struggling, support French, um but I mean I've always found the culture to be at its best when it's you know when when people are doing music festivals or, 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 you know, cinema, film, whatever, like Quebec has a super vibrant art and, and theater and cinema scene. And like, and, and that shit to me is like so much, much easier to sell the language with that, you know, with poetry. Absolutely. And like, like that beautiful stuff that we, we do. And, and, and it's kind of the same thing you're seeing in, in like, you know, you're seeing in like indigenous uh, languages like like people are drawn in. I mean, obviously, it's, it's apples and oranges. Indigenous people losing their languages has a lot to do with the French and the English, and it's not the same. But but you're seeing art. Uh, you know, uh, you're seeing songs. You're seeing literature. You're seeing you know, and 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 they're starting to have appeal in non-indigenous circles. Like like it it so it you're seeing like that you know it's it's a vibrancy and it and it's a choice people make and sometimes i think people are just frustrated that not pe more people are making that choice that not more people are, are thinking about say like franco ontarians when they go to the polls um you know they're thinking about their their pocketbook issues and so you know you compensate a, a lot when you're on the other side of that you're but like well you're not talking about our issues enough we'll talk about them so much but we're not really going to do anything about it huh. either and also i think it's worth mentioning that you know we're as of now, a bilingual country, and that Quebec doesn't own the, I don't know how you say that in English, but it, the, it doesn't, it's not the only place where you speak French, right? Like you have, yeah. as, as you said, like Franco-Ontarians, uh, and they have a rich history and a fight, yeah. like a, a fist, <laughs> a fistful oh, yeah. history where grandmas were in front of schools with their needles uh, waiting for inspectors because th they were banning the, the the French in schools and they were like, no, not not on our watch. Like that, that's really known in the Franco-Ontarien circle, but like just making it more relevant to each provinces to say like there are Franco-Albertans, there are Franco-British Columbians. They're not a lot, there's not a lot of them, but they exist, they have a history. And it's it's all tied back to like the nineteen like the end of the nineteen sixties where there were this thing called like the États Généraux du Canada Français, and Quebec kind of took on its uh, back the, the 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 French and just said like we own French basically, and then it, it kind of disenfranchised this idea this identity of of Franco Canadianism, um, but I think you know just like 
recognizing that there's a rich French uh, history in each provinces could already yeah. help. Denise Bombardier uh, is like regularly condescending to the French people speak outside of Quebec, you know, oh, they speak in the prairies, they're stupid, or like, and, and a lot of people who defend French here only give it lip service elsewhere, and when it comes down to it, they don't, they mm -hmm. won't do anything other than maybe like make a little bit of noise, but they won't do anything to defend French elsewhere, and, and I think you have to defend it all over, like look at what's happening in, in Louisiana right now, like people who, mm -hmm. you know, people are, are rediscovering French and like, and, and it's what gives me hope ultimately is that, you know, language contains the vitality of, of a people and like that shit has to survive. And I think if we all have that in mind, then, then we, it will survive. And, you know, I, I certainly like, the, I try to sort of occasionally say like, look, I mean, look at indigenous languages, like those, um, you think your language is threatened, like, so, you know, you have places, languages that are wiped out or, and like, what are you doing to help them? Because like, it's a struggle that we're all in or it's a struggle that none of us are in. And, you know, I'm very interested in how the two topics we've been discussing relate to one another, because uh, if we're talking about ways to protect the French language in North America, it, it seems like the, the obvious answer is, is the same way that we're growing any population in the, in the Western world, which is we have to rely on immigration. Western countries just, just aren't producing enough babies by themselves anymore. We need to have immigration. Where are these French immigrants coming from? Uh, well, if we look at where, the, where France colonized uh, the world, uh, you know, it's Haiti, it's Northern Africa, it's the Middle East. You know, can we think of reasons why people from these places wouldn't want to come to Quebec after what we talked about in the first half of the show? Like, it's, uh, it, it seems like the, we're, we're sort of chasing uh, one problem uh, uh, with another. And that if we're going to make a, a place where people are, are more comfortable to speak French, we have to change the culture a little bit so that uh, those people that do speak French are, are comfortable to come here in the first place. A hundred percent. But what's interesting is also within, and I, I'm going to talk more about the, this population, if, if, if I may, because that's sure, yeah. who I know best, but it, like it, within m like Muslim immigrants here in Quebec, there's even uh, inner fights, you know, uh, some mm -hmm. people f flew away from their home countries where they felt that religion was oppressing. So, so I think it also is, I'm not like for one or the other, but I just feel like that's, um, it, it takes away from the debate when you also just paint this, this big discourse with only white people. Like I, I didn't mm -hmm. hear a lot of, of women of color included in the debate, except from those fringe um, left wing places, or there's like this, um, or there's like lip service people from the, the right that are, you know, it's like the token Muslim or the token black person yeah. that just comes to speak. So I, I, I crave a larger debate. Like if we're to have a debate about people, like let's hear them and include them because they're, they might be even the, the solution to this this law maybe uh, people like immigrants will tell you hey you know what it's it's actually a minority that it, it's affecting so can we yeah be more nuanced in, in the laws that we're proposing there's actually a really good uh news site in quebec called la converse and um it's primarily women of color and they uh th they do a really really good job i mean it's super interesting they, they look at issues that we might think are just kind of small side retail issues and they, they go deep and, and it's, and it's, it's from like, the thing is like, Anais is so right. Like this, we had a huge debate over bill 21 and before that, the charter of values that barely included the, the, the diversity within the Muslim community. Like mm -hmm. it, you'd be lucky if you got a Muslim source on one of those stories, never mind three or four or five or six. So there were, there was, you know, there was, you were always presented with this weird false dichotomy of like, oh, well, what about the women who are being forced by their husbands and forced by, which by the way, is so infantilizing and incredibly, you know, to assume that that's what's, ha not, not that it doesn't happen, but it, you know, to assume that is super infantilizing, but like they, they, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it because this, you know, we don't have enough journalists of color, we don't have enough Muslim journalists because um, there, there's such an underrepresentation in the media, 
then like you don't have someone in the newsroom going like, oh yeah, dude, don't do that or don't say that. Like that's not or like talk to this person or talk to that person or like understand that you know like all, all it would take is to know a few more people in in your inner circle or like I'm and and I think you would just approach things with more nuance and. And unfortunately, because our newsrooms are so homogenous and it's changing, but you know, when I was at the Gazette, it was a very white newsroom and, and I've been to La Presse before and it's a pretty white newsroom and, 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 um, and Jolanda Moyad is a very white newsroom until you start. And these are big, you know, these are not like marginal, these are huge sources of, of these are, these drive the news yeah. and I don't see very many Muslims in the driver's seat. I'm not saying everyone has to be Muslim at the newspaper, but like if you had more, um, more real diversity in your staff, first of all, you'd get better stories, and I think that's your number one, right? To get a better, more truthful, more accurate stories, you would. You just get awesome uh, stories from different communities, but then also you wouldn't say stupid shit that you end up regretting for years, and it's in print. And you know what else you would you wouldn't regret if if we lack anglophones in our newsrooms. We lack people like like you, you know, that... Is the, that <laughs> there are, are too no, many of me in your newsrooms already, just the one. N n no, but like maybe someone who speaks uh, or or is like truly bilingual, like we lack those accesses to yeah. maybe um, Indian immigrants that speak English mostly, you know, that that yeah, is another... Yeah. Like, I, I don't see that. I hear a lot of, um, especially in Quebec, like I, I hear this very secluded view of who the English people are. And that's another problem that feeds into all the discussions yeah. we're having around, well, say, Bill 96. It's, it's, um, it's hard. Like, the one thing I will say about Anglophones in Quebec, and this is the one thing I think I have to say, this is the only comment I'll make on this, is that um, there is a kind of weird, when people get mad, some people get mad at us, They'll be like, oh, yeah, well, if you don't like it, like, go to Ontario or like, or we're, or there's this idea that like, we have a, we have a close tie to the rest of Canada, which I don't think I do at all. Like, I'm very much a Quebecer. Like, this is the place I know. And when I'm elsewhere in Canada, I always feel unusual that I'm not seeing and hearing more French. And I always feel a little bit, of, I mean, I like it. It's, it's, you know, it's, these are a lot of cousins and friends and whatever live, live in other parts of the country. But like, this is my home and I love it. And um, and I love speaking French and I love the nuances of the culture and I love, um, the excesses and I love, I love the humor. Um, you know, and, and a lot of these, like, um, a lot of people who like take a dump on me or whatever, like I, I worked in construction for like eight years speaking almost exclusively French and like, you know, those guys who work for a living and like who, who your core audience, like you don't know anything about them, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I could kind of turn that criticism towards them as well, but, but all, all of which is to say, like, we identify, or maybe some people identify as Canadians, or maybe a lot of them do, but we all, in a very deep level, identify as Quebecers, and, and it's, uh, and it's unfortunate that people think that, you know, or they'll, they'll accuse us of Quebec bashing, as though we ourselves aren't Quebecers, and we don't get to kind of participate in the identity of the, and, and I think that, the, the, you know, we, there is a uniqueness to the culture here. And there is a, even just like, I, I grew up north of Montreal surrounded, you know, in, in basically a Francophone community, but like with Anglophones in it, like our attitude is much like we were the Montrealers at, in college would treat us like we were hillbillies, you know, like we were from some backwoods <laughs> and they would like, and so like, even within Anglo Quebec, there's like uh, a whole uh, range of identities and, and yeah, so it's like kind of lumping us all in. Like, I, I've 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 often heard like, oh, well, you know, uh, the dropout rates are um, are lower among Anglophones because you know, well, yeah, no one's dropping out of high school in Westmount. Like, dude, we actually disproportionately are our our median income is lower than yours, and our average income is about the same. We are you. We're Quebecers. Like, we're you know, we yeah. There's a Westmount, but there's also you know what uh you know there's like a oh, la salle yeah there's a west mount but like there's a point saint charles like yeah there's a west mount but like there's a lake of two mountains high school which was a dump but you know it, it, so so all of which is to say like we we are quebecers and we um and we have a lot of the same struggles as you do and we have a lot of the same aspirations and hopes and love in our hearts and um and we're not all these rich assholes from west mount only some so, of us and there's good rich assholes from west mount 
that's beautiful that that i've never heard i think or barely ever heard on on french media in, in quebec well i really liked that chris and uh i think that that's a good point to transition on to um well a, a, another heavy topic uh, so and and uh, you, you covered the coroner's report uh into the death of joyce Eshaquan and it, what a what a tragedy that was and uh, just a horrific story that is a story that uh, you know my family and the rest of Canada knew about like that was one of those sort of rare I don't want to say rare stories that kind of breaks and goes goes national but it, it was a big story and um, you know it, it's interesting because certainly I would say all of Canada has had their struggles with with, with anti-indigenous racism and, and continues to have their struggles with anti-indigenous uh, racism and uh, it's it's interesting. It's just interesting to see how racism manifests itself in the rest of Canada versus in Quebec. You have a premier in Quebec who seems to struggle with even admitting that there is systemic racism. Um, you have a premier who, um, you know, despite numerous columnists who regularly praise him, having said blatantly racist things themselves over the years, despite things he said. And then in the rest of Canada, you have a lot of lip service where, oh, yeah, yeah, reconciliation. Oh, yeah, yeah, truth. But then the racism manifests itself in other ways, like inaction or, you know, kick, constantly kicking the can or, you know, boil water advisories that are still ongoing throughout the rest of the country. Now, with with the specific case of, of Joyce Eshaquan, I guess what I want to know from you guys is how did how did this woman get into a situation where this is what happened to her because she's indigenous because to me that's what it seems like yeah, it's a, yeah. yeah. and how does that yeah. and how is that how, i i don't understand how that is allowed to happen but at the same time it was one of those moments where like i don't understand how that's allowed to happen but sadly i'm not surprised like it was one of those disappointed but not surprised moments so how do we how do we prevent another instance of that from happening again? What will it take for the government to recognize systemic racism? What will it take for nurses to maybe have some sort of anti discrimination training? What you know, like what are the solutions to this? There was actually they they were trained they they did have sensitivity training. My God, <laughs> they didn't really <laughs> apparently seem to give not. A shit. Wow, I didn't know that. No, no one really took them. Yeah, that that was one of the big things that I found from the the inquiry you know the the, the coroner Jeanne Camille who did a, a tremendous job uh, don't ask was, Isabelle she she thought it was uh, like she was real mean it, it, you, you could see how baffled she was at, at seeing a how things were in place already but weren't exploited the, uh, for instance the the sensitivity training was in place uh -huh. but I think only two percent of, of nurses Yikes. took it but also just the discourse, like the, um, she was calling to the bar all those witnesses, uh, multiple nurses. And f from my point of view, what also, and it's not to take away from the entire inquiry, but I was also shocked at hearing a lot of nurses saying, well, you know what, we would treat the same, we, we would treat someone who's drunk or someone who's poor the same Or way. someone who's poor. Um, which, <laughs> yeah, like. <laughs> Great, that clears it up, thanks. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> so that that pointed out to a perhaps a bigger problem uh but no i i think it's you you have to have the government on board to prevent things like that to happen but you also i don't know it's it's also how we have a relationship with indigenous people in, in the communities that needs to shift and I, I don't know how it can only be on on governments Chris, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, um, I was actually in Anish uh, Anishinaabe territory when the news broke, and I remember being so fucking, like, a deep rage. Um, so I was working on something about, uh, you know, women who had, who had died and, and disappeared and been uh, assaulted by the police, and, like, and you think, like, oh, it just never ends. And... Um, Down and, doll, and right? It... Um, and a guy, you know, like a guy who was taken on a, you know, a starlight tour and all that, all that like awful shit. And, um, <clears throat> when I, what, what's upsetting about this is the, is, is that it, the debate, like one of the nurses said, and <laughs> I'm going to bring this 
Gollum messed up again. And then one of Isabel Ashe's columns, a nurse said, um, well, you know, like she was quoting nurses from the, the, uh, the hospital where Joyce died. And, uh, and she said, uh, well, you know, I'm just afraid that, um, I'm just so afraid. I don't want to treat indigenous people anymore because I'm just afraid I'll do something that's going to be considered racist. And it's like, okay, homie, let me just stop you for a second there. They come to the hospital and they're afraid that they'll die with you laughing at them, like yeah. being right. mocked. And that's going to be their last moment is like writhing in pain, being treated like human garbage. You're yeah. afraid that someone maybe will think you're doing something racist, maybe, or that like anything you do is going to be considered racist. Like, my man, you have so much baggage to unpack. Like, but th that's the problem is that one of the problems is that the idea that like, you are perceived as having done something. I'm not saying you're racist, but like you did a racist thing. I've done racist things. Like I'm not proud of it, but I'm not so fucking stupid as to deny that. Like I, I'm capable of that. We all are, and that's, and that's, and that's like that's what, one of the reasons that it thrives is people think like this. The minute you do it, you know, you're or like the minute you admit it, then oh well, you're gonna be exiled from society. But it's actually quite the contrary. Like if you're honest about it. Um, then, you know, then, then a real conversation can start. And I think a lot of people aren't ready for that conversation, no matter how much evidence you put in front of them. And, like, to, to give you an idea, like, the Quebec government is the only government in Canada right now that is suing the federal government to block the transfer of youth protection from provincial jurisdictions to, uh, to the First Nations themselves. So, like, this is, if anything... This is, would be good for Quebec because they don't have to keep statistics or like, like they don't like, or they, they might, or they do in some cases. But what I mean is like, they don't have that extra burden of like more cases and more caseloads and whatever. Like they get, like these, these communities get to control it themselves. And in reality, it's been a success everywhere it's been applied. It's been a huge success because First Nations that, that regain control of their youth protection system are First Nations that can start healing from, from intergenerational trauma. And when that happens, um, everything benefits. Crime goes down, kids do better in school, uh, the future is a little bit brighter. And all you had to do as Premier of Quebec was get out of the way, just get out of the way. But he insisted on suing the government and blocking uh, this this transfer of, of money that is rightfully belongs to the First Nations. But you know, blocking this transfer of funds and blocking this transfer of jurisdiction and, and really blocking people from controlling their children's futures because you wanted a political win and you wanted to look tough fighting Canada and you wanted to be able to take credit for eventually Quebec, because Quebec is already has like a sort of program that transitions uh, First Nations control to um, from like back mostly nominally to, to First Nations. So like I think it was just let's let's show off our own thing. We don't want theirs. We want to keep control of it. So like you can say all you want, but if that's the example you're setting for people that like you know these people are pawns and we have to control them and and in arguments before the court, uh, the court of Quebec, the government's lawyers said like well these people can't be trusted to care for their children. They don't have the competence. So like oh my god, you know that to me is profoundly racist, and Dude. and that shit is like and that's not even the political party. Those are government lawyers. <clears throat> They're not partisan. They're, they work for the government. So, like, this is institutional. This is the definition of systemic racism. And, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it's playing out before our eyes. And, but because it doesn't, because nobody filmed it and no one's screaming and crying, oh, well, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not such a big deal. But I guarantee you that, like, if they're getting in the way of these transfers and if these transfers are taking lives, they're putting, or taking taking longer than they should, then they're putting lives at risk. They're putting the lives of children and their parents at risk. And they're doing that for political gain. And, and you know, to me, that is, that is despicable on such a deep level. Yeah. I'm I, sorry. There's not even, that. like, a thing we could debate. I apologize. No. Oh, well, no, there's nothing to debate. That's It's just... <laughs> you're you're bang on. I think you you pretty much succinctly summed it up. And I'll pull Jacob in here to see if he has any thoughts, and then we'll uh, we'll go to the next topic. Well, well, Chris, I was uh, very disturbed when I was reading your reporting into uh, Val d'Or as well. And the um, if I recall uh, correctly, the details there was uh, twelve or thirteen indigenous women had made um, allegations against uh, SQ officers in that city that they had been 
uh, attacked by police, either physically or sexually. And uh, the, the allegation is so horrible, the justice minister came back is crying on television while, while announcing the investigation into them. Puts a few, the province puts a few of these uh, um, police officers um, on suspension while there's an investigation. And then the next day, when this is announced, the whole police attach, uh, uh, attachment in Val d'Or uh, calls in sick in solidarity with their uh, alleged uh, uh, assaulters. Like that's mm-hmm. a, if you're talking about uh, like y- this isn't simple cases. Actions like bad speak apples. louder than words, man. Yeah, you can say exactly. a dirty word, but that you know to to refuse to do your job because some of your because some of your people are not even they haven't been charged with shit. They're just being investigated and they're being sidelined to avoid a distraction. Like it's not, you know, this isn't a major thing. This is, uh, yeah, I mean. That was that's violence and that's and that's intimidation. That's you're telling yeah. everybody in that city that like we won't do our jobs if you report us. You know we yeah, exactly. we will not keep you safe. And I, I you know I'm not some big advocate of the police, but like we won't do the bare minimum if you if you tell on us, we are going to fuck with your shit. And that to me, that's what the message was. And to take it a step further. Um, what I found uh, in my reporting was that uh, actually they had hired a private investigator, mm. uh, the lawyer, the lawyers, uh, the law firm representing the police. So the police's union hired a private investigator who was a former RCMP agent who would go around and show his card and like very much, which was very much made to seem like he's still a cop. <clears throat> and um, and he would basically like like he found one of these women brought her to a hotel room and started grilling her, started interrogating her, basically. She thought he was a cop. So he tried to do it again, but this time she brought a worker from the uh, the Native Friendship Center. <clears throat> they realized that he wasn't a cop. Uh, they took his his uh, number, or someone had been given his card, so they kept it, and yeah, they gave me the card, and they were like, <laughs> gave me, and I called the guy, and I confirmed the story, because, you know, he's an idiot. He shouldn't have given me his name when I announced I was a journalist. Um... <laughs> No, I mean, I wouldn't have had anything, but he just fucking gave himself right up, right up to me. So, like, way to go. You're a shitty cop and a shitty fucking criminal. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if what he did was criminal. Uh, I, I really can't say that with certainty, so I'm sorry for that. If any lawyers are listening. It was, it was thuggish behavior, regardless it of was, criminal. Yeah, it was thuggish, thuggish. behavior. And, and I do, I really do believe that. And, um, and I mean, that's just, again, like, these, the same people who organized that walkout, like, the, these cops hired a lawyer to like attack the victims and and they were trying to get information on other victims and they were like it was this whole kind of like the day after the news broke or a couple days after the news broke the cops leaked i think leaked one of the names or a few of the crim like a criminal record or something of one of the women to a reporter like and i mean what does that you know what does that tell you about about their strategy like they play dirty and they discredit victims they they intimidate victims and like and yeah, and, and again, this is an institution. This is the provincial police. This is one of the, you know, they have an incredible amount of authority. I think they have five, 6,000 officers across the province. Like, like yeah, these are pe- very powerful people, and they refuse to be accountable for allegedly, you know. And, and by the way, like an independent investigation into their investigation in, or into the police investigation into the police. Please, I know it's confusing, but, you know, anyways. Um found that none of the victims, like, the victims were all credible. They were all perfectly credible. They just mm-hmm. couldn't find corroborating evidence, and which is uh, often the case in, in instances involving sexual assault, and it's often the case in instances involving an authority figure. And I, I don't know if you ran across that, Chris, whilst being in, in uh, Abitibi, but I, I feel we're going to hear a lot about that in the, the upcoming months or years, but... Um, there's also cases of indigenous women being sterilized yeah. um, without consent. Um, there's a lawsuit right now in the prairies regarding forced sterilization without consent. And I know that um, the university up there in Val uh, is looking into it because apparently there's more cases than we think. So talking about in the institution of the police. Now we also have the medical institution. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just curious to to see if you've uh, heard those stories. I mean, you hear horror stories about uh, how people are treated uh, at the hospital. 
there there's plenty you know people have been turned aside people like or refused treatment like that has happened uh sterilization i'm i'm we could hear about it i'm i'm not plugged into that but uh i mean i know that if it's not for sterilization then it's you know youth protection getting involved in in someone's life and you know once they get their foot in the door it's really hard to get to get your kids back and to you know to 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 have that to, you know to have that again and and so it's 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 more that well i think you nailed it it's like how many how many institutions right the schools the church um the the you know the schools the church the cops uh the you know, government fucking how, but it's how many of them exactly <laughs> and it's and it's crazy cuz it's like he'll he'll come pretty close to sometimes to saying it and he'll be like However, just, say it. just for the columnists who are listening, I didn't say the word, therefore everything's fine. And it's so silly. It's like, it's almost like when people were like, oh, you know, there's a tape. Like, I don't know if you guys remember this, but like, there's a tape of Trump saying the N word. Like, is oh, yeah. it, like <laughs> this was what people needed. Like, okay, once he said the magic word, the spell will be broken. Like, look, if you don't fucking know he's racist by now, you, I guess you're also pretty fucking racist. <laughs> so like... <laughs> It's not like if he says it, it's not going to make a difference. But, but, you know, I think they know. I don't know. I don't know. It's really hard. It's really hard to. I think it goes back to that kind of duality of like you were oppressed, but you must know that you're also capable of oppression. And you were, and you know, and, and though you may have been a less efficient colonialist, you were still a colonialist. Like, it's not, it doesn't erase. The, there aren't degrees of colonialization. You know, it's not like, oh, well, th thanks for not, like, macheteing me. Like, no, it's not, that's not how it works. No one's going to give you a trophy because you didn't put people in concentration camps. Like, that's not how it works. And I think some people kind of wish it worked that way, but it's not. Like, no, you're not going to get a better grade from, from indigenous people across Canada because, uh, you know, you, you're, you were less brutal. Like, you were brutal, and there were slaves, and there was viciousness, and... You know, it's not like the uh, residential schools were, like, Quebecers participated in that, too. Uh, you know, it's not like the, they were like, oh, let's resist this government. No, no one no one resisted, and I think complicity is its own crime, and people have to... The, the ultimate crime of all most Canadians is complicity, like, and that's... And I include myself yeah. in that. Yeah, me, myself as well, and uh, you know what? That brings me, speaking of, of right-wing figures and cra saying crazy things... Brings me to the last topic uh, I'd like to ask you guys about, and that is the rise of Eric Duhame. What is going on there? We've got he's soaring up the polls. Uh, the historic Patsy Quebecois is at all time lows. Help me, help me unpack this. Why the rise of the Quebec Conservatives? Well, Why is that happening? He, he's for one always on radio, like the the Radio yeah. X. He's always there I, I i question how or according to like, la price only three times a week <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Um, but i i truly think that with um all what we've seen uh with the the, the, the liberty convoy and such i think in quebec there is a, a void for outwardly conservative people mm -hmm. um at, at the legislative or the l'assemblée mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's what he just f fills in. You know, he fills that gap where people feel unrepresented politically to the right. And we see, as you said, like a historical low for the Parti Québécois. You know who, which other party is rising? The Qu Québec solidaire. So what I see is a, a, a true polarization of opinions. And I think that's where he's rising, Eric Duhem. And he's also like a, 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 a like a figure that's been around for quite a uh, a time. He's very savvy, very smart. He's capable of switching. He's code switching basically. So he's able to um, address a crowd that's very conservative and, and say the right things, but also pass as I don't know still from the right um and i think that's why we see him rise because people just are polarized huh. i think that sums it up pretty good and he was a shock jock wasn't he so that he's got that i guess he still kind of is a shock jock because he keeps dropping into radio x um but yeah i mean it's, it's just this i think a lot of canadians have have for a while had this 
I, I want to say smugness, to be honest. Like, you know, uh, a Trump-like figure couldn't happen here. And, you know, not to say that Eric Eric Duhem is, well, pure, you know, pure like... Pure Coley barking up that well, tree. Well, but, yep. it, well, exactly. I was just going to say, so you've got Eric Duhem, not that he's exactly like Trump, but I would compare him to a Trump figure. And you've got Pierre Polyev barking up the tree. Like, bang on, Chris. And so we're not immune and it's happening. And I think uh, Anais makes a great point as well when she says that, uh, when you say Anais, that uh, you're seeing this, this polarization really play itself out. And the you only, know, I, the I've only been thing reading... I would say to kind of like the, the, the Quebec Solidar has benefited from a lot of attention over the last four years because um, tactically Francois Legault knows that if he attacks the liberals, he might actually force them into remembering, you know, like their whatever their core values or whatever. If he attacks the liberals directly, <laughs> values? no, What's but that? if he ac- attacks the, the liberals d- directly, he legitimizes them. He's actually done something really clever, which is he he attacks, he treats Quebec Solidaire like they're his true uh, enemies, even though they're you know they're the mm-hmm. third, the second opposition party. Well, that's and, what Jean Chrétien would do to uh, pr- he would treat Preston Manning like opposition leader to ignore um, Bouchard. Exactly. Yeah, in yeah. The yeah. 90s. So, so, so there's that element of it. But I would say that like w- what Quebec Solidaire is suffering from isn't a lack of visibility. Like they've had a lot of visibility over the last four years, and their polling hasn't gotten that much better, which leads me to like fear for the future of politics in this in this province. Since I mean. They, things do change quickly here. Like we can all be communists tomorrow. Whoever knows, you know. Like it, it really does. <laughs> there sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to it. <laughs> um, but but um, the you know sixty in a lot, in one of the polls, it's something like sixty percent would vote for the CAC, which I mean, if you ask me, is pretty openly conservative. But I but but uh, on 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 certain things, they are more liberal. Um, the CAC or Eric Duhem's Quebec Conservative Party which looks like a butt plug. I can't get it out of my head. I'm sorry. The logo, the logo. I'm going to see that forever it's now. It's like, you oh, can't no. see it. It's so disturbing. Not that, no, not that like the, the, anything wrong with people experiencing their pleasure. I just, I just for some <laughs> reason, when I think of like my men in politics and butt plugs, I'm not like, it's, it's distracting. Anyhow, um, where was I? Oh yes. Butt plugs. No. <laughs> um, so 60% of the province would vote for one of these two parties, one of whom is, like, led by a person who's openly racist. Like, yeah. he compared, um, like, he, he, there's so much Islamophobia that he's said over the years, like, I've lost count, you know, and, and, and he's had people on his show, you know, he's had some very bad people on his show. And, and most recently, you know, like, the, the, the mosque massacre, uh, the ma- massacre at the mosque in Quebec where six people were killed and, Many more were, were gunned down. Um, the, before that happened, the same mosque was like, and I'm going to say pranked, but it was this is not a prank, it's a hate crime, was pranked by someone who left a severed pig's head in front of the mosque with a note that said, like, Bon Appetit. And, um, and it, you know, and, and, and Zuayim was like, well, that's not a hate crime, that's just a prank. And in an interview recently where he's trying to, like, clear that up, he's like, well, you know, it's wrong in the way that, like, ordering pizza for your neighbor and, like, not paying for it, like, you know, prank ordering pizza. Come on. Exactly the same thing. It's like prank ordering pizza for your neighbor and then murdering him, like, the next month. Like, no, it's nothing like that, you fucking idiot. But, but, um, sorry, all of which is to say, like, like, uh, we're, we're, he's being normalized. Like, like, getting a, getting a nice kind of, you know, there's criticism of him, but it's more, it's, it's not a hard... It's not a super critical portrait of of uh, Eric Zuhaim. It's 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 a portrait of Eric Zuhaim, and, and it, I would say it's it's almost a favorable portrait of Eric Zuhaim. But the, the the effect it has is that it normalizes him in 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 politics. He's being normalized, like he's being invited to these big talk shows, and it's totally. being like okay, well, it doesn't matter what he said in the past, and he said like disgusting things about women, disgusting things about uh, you know about minorities, and and. And hateful things, and uh, so like it's, you can say all that shit, and you're fine. You know, you can, well, we're, we're like laundering his reputation and legitimizing him. I don't think he'll have a huge showing in the elections. He might win a seat whenever Jeff Fillion decides he's going to announce his run. He might win a seat, but I don't see the party. You know, right now, maybe later. Maybe there's more populist rage. Maybe as of fuel keeps going up and and inflation gets out of control and people go crazy. And who knows what happens then? But like. I think Quebec well, Chris, is, is experiencing a really conservative moment right now. 
And I, well, I think it's 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 caught up in the sort of national wave, which is you know like with Pierre Polyev nationally with with Eric Duhem. Uh, I I think it it's it's this sort of wave, and it's I think it manifested itself in the convoy. It manifested yeah. itself in in the Quebec. The CAC is not going to uh, run soaring in a, a middle numbers. election. They're going to run to the right because that's where right. they feel their threat is, and and the, the and and the liberals years of like sloppy politics and years of glad handing and corruption and being arrogant to the youth years of having a leader like Jean Charest have, have kind of destroyed that party. And, and I don't know if it's worth saving. I th honestly, like, I feel like it should be burned to the ground. Uh, Quebec Solidaire is not really moving in the polls. Um, you know, uh, Parti Québécois is led by a 75 year old man trapped in a 40 year old man's body. Um, <laughs> he's so boring. I don't even remember his name. Uh, Pierre, Poliev, Simon, whatever. Anyways, he was educated at Oxford and he doesn't matter. And he's, you know, he's like, <laughs> he's, and he, he's like, everything the cat does, I'm going to the right of it. It's yeah. those, no, but like he's, he's, the thing is he's irrelevant and it's, it's hilarious to see them writhe and get involved in their little culture wars. And it's like, buddy, do you think if you like get on all fours and bark for this government, <laughs> they're going to like let you keep your email when they inevitably take over your office? Like... They're gonna like let you be a staffer or something, or you can go on the political shows because you, you're you're so far from the concerns of everyday people that like the biggest policy issue you can think of is like, uh, what if Quebec had an army, which is something he floated, or uh, oh, let's do boy. Bill 101 in Cejep. Like, dude, you're, you 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 have inherited a lineage of politicians that go back to like some of the greatest politicians in North American history. You are a fucking loser. And I'm sorry for saying it, but like, <laughs> all they're doing right now is making noise in a debate. And I'm sorry, like, like I, I don't, I don't see, I don't, I, yeah, I sh maybe that's a rude thing to call them a loser, but, but like, what are they doing? Well, what are they doing? They're, they're, where they're are just, they in the polls? They're putting more red meat into a debate that doesn't need it. They're stuck on these niche issues. By the end of the next election, there might be a, two seats left in the Gaspésie region, and I mean at this point they're just like trolls who complain about other people getting affirmative action when like in fact they got affirmative action when they were elected they didn't even have enough seats to have official party status but the national assembly gave them some charity and uh they are the beneficiaries of a lot of uh my money to uh to basically exist in parliament because their feelings were hurt so you know all of a sudden like the you know, they're, they're real big on rules as rules when, like, uh, a university chair it needs to be occupied by a woman or a BIPOC person. Uh, but they're, you know, suddenly the rules are a little more flexible when they need a handout. So, like, I'm sorry. Like, this is one of the great political movements in North America. And it's just, it's reduced to this boy in his dad's suit. And, and on the other hand, you, you have a, a party that's so inept that they recommended an amendment to Bill 96 that is going to cost them huge in the next election and that goes against the, their their base in such a significant way that, you know, Anglophones are openly talking about starting new parties and, like... like so they should. So, like, so you, they you, should. Gotta give, you gotta give the opposition credit. They fucked up real big, spectacularly. And I, I gotta, I, you know, I, I, I've been reading a lot about... You know, and I you were talking earlier about uh, the, sort of the increased polarization, and I've been I've been reading a, a lot about what some people say is the increasing polarization, what others say is the perception of increasing polarization. I'm somewhere in the middle. Clearly, the the I mean, have you been on Twitter? The it's like a, a hot dumpster fire. I mean, not that everybody, not that Twitter is the town square for everybody, but my gosh, it, is, is it ever difficult? to have conversations about difficult issues with certain people in a civil way. And, um, and you know, I was reading a piece by, I believe it was Aaron, Aaron Wary from uh, CBC. He was saying that um, there's, there's a lot of fundamental things about Canada that we actually all agree on for the most part, but it's surprise, surprise politicians stoking the culture wars that makes it seem like we're more polarized than we are. And we are polarized. Like, we wouldn't be seeing Eric Duhem rise in the poll if, in the polls if we weren't, and Pierre Polyev if, if we weren't. But it, it, it's it's definitely there's an opportunity for, and, and I mean I don't know where they are right now because it seems like this political class has been pretty dormant as of late. But there's 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 a space for a great Canadian leader or a great Quebecois to come sort of in the mix 
and remind us of what we do agree on and remind us of the, of what we can do together. And it's like Chris was saying earlier about, you know, like, he's like, I'm a Quebecer. Like I, I, and like Quebecers are some of the, the warmest people you'll ever meet. And like, it's, it's just these culture wars are getting in the way of our ability to view each other as human. It's dehumanizing us and it's, it's removing our ability to speak rationally and with love about things. And I, I think, I don't even have a question for you guys. That's just my comment, like to, <laughs> to add to this, comment. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, that's my comment. And, and with that, you guys, uh, you know, Jacob, is there anything else you want to say or should I wrap up here? Well, I, I would just like to, to say if there's one thing that, that seems to be a general trend here, it's that the, the goal of the political discourse is not necessarily to be the craziest person in the room, but to be the, the second craziest person in the room. Like people, they want something a little bit offbeat but they also want to feel like you're you're still relatively sane. And I think guys like Eric DeHaam are good at sort of shifting the Overton window. They're increasing <laughs> the, the level of acceptable political discourse so that someone like Legault, he now has that space to, to fill in. So you look and, you know, I, I know the Quebecers hate being compared to, uh, to the French, but I think that exactly the same thing's happening in France right now with like, uh, you know, Marine Le Pen has been there forever, never really getting traction. Now you have Zemmour, who's a, a, just a little bit farther to the right than her, soaking up all the crazy airspace, and now she's the one that looks like the moderate <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, uh, yeah, right-wing yeah. candidate. And she mm -hmm. can, she has a shot of winning against uh, against Macron right now, I think, because of it. Pierre Polyev is the same thing. Like, Ber Bernier's crazier than him, so now Pierre oh my is going <laughs> to—he's going to be— I never thought of it —the moderate, way. right? And even in, even in the Conservative Party, like, uh, PP, as we like to call him on this podcast, is— is sort of centrist for that party. Like it's gone so far to the right that Pierre By the way, Polyev, I have um I just want to make announce this right now. The rover yeah. has its first Pierre Polyev comic coming out soon, so. Comic. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Oh man. <laughs> wow. Well, there you go, listeners. Four yeah. panels of pure joy. Check out yeah, the rover. But it's like we're we're in this very dangerous situation where these these fire brands are are shifting the conversation so much that the guys that are left over uh, are now feeling more comfortable to let the inner racist out because they uh, they they know that the the, the crazy spotlight's going to be soaked up by someone else, and uh, that's a dangerous spot to be in. Second craziest person, <laughs> I like that. You don't have to be the fastest guy. You just have to be not slow. The bear will eat exactly. the slow guy. You just have yeah, to be exactly. fast. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You got to be faster than the guy in the bush with you. What's the old saying? <laughs> yeah. First is the worst. Second is the best. I mean, there you go. <laughs> um, but with that, you guys, all of you, thank you so much for coming onto the show, for making yourselves available, uh, for correcting us and, and uh, you know, you're being there to help us to help form a better understanding of what's going on in uh, La Belle Province. Uh, Chris, Anais, uh, welcome back anytime and thanks for doing what you do. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. And I appreciate that you're having a, a francophone on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That was important to uh, us. An Anais, uh, Jacob, Liam, thank you. It was, it was really cool talking to you guys. And yeah, I just talk shit sometimes. So, I, I, you know, everything I said, just take 15% off the top, okay? We love to hear that shit, though. This was the best <laughs> episode by far. <laughs> Real pleasure, guys. And, and listeners, if you are a fan of what you heard if you're not a fan of what you heard if you want to rage in my inbox in our inbox i should say it's speech from the throne at gmail.com that's speech from the throne at gmail.com uh and with that we will see you in the next one Bye.